I hereby open the meeting. Mr. Oshupkin, I bid you welcome. You are appearing before a committee appointed by the Doctorate Board of the Erasmus University, Rotterdam, to defend your thesis and the appendant propositions. Before we start the discussion, I invite you to give a short introduction in which you tell us about the subject, the aims of your study, and importantly, your findings, please. Thank you. Dear Sir Rector Magnificus, committee members, family, friends, and colleagues, in the next 15 minutes, I'm going to give you a general overview about the research, what I have done in the last four years in the field of imaging genetics. And this field, trying to combine knowledge, data, and method from two different areas. One of them is near imaging. And as you can guess from its names, it studied the human brain, one of the most complex and fascinated organ in human body. And there are a lot of scientists all over the world which are trying to understand how it works and the functions of human brain. And there are, of course, many reasons why we want to do this and why we want to know how our brain works. Because the human brain is responsible for such high level human abilities as, for example, consciousness and cognitive functions, but also responsible for everyday routines such as language, skills, or motor functions. But what is also very important then when our brain doesn't work properly, it give, can give uh, rise for various brain diseases, such as uh, neurodegenerative diseases, for example, Alzheimer's disease, or psychiatric disorders, such as schizophrenia. That's why if we want to understand the cause of these disorders and to develop uh, drugs and treatment, we need to understand better how our brain works. But till recently, it was quite difficult to do non-invasively, but only when, since the MRI technology was introduced, now we can acquire the 3D image of the brain to any subject. And for example, we can scan sub subject with uh, Alzheimer's disease and healthy subject. And just by simple eyeballing, we can see that the subject with Alzheimer has smaller brain or shrink brain, or how we call it has atrophy in various brain regions. But of course, this is just a simple comparison and with the visual, with the visual expectation. And you might imagine that actually human brain, because of his complexity, different brain regions, they're responsible for different functions. And that's why different disorders might affect it differently. That's why we can use a more advanced near imaging technology and not only extract human brain from MRI, but apply some automatic pipelines and segment the human brain in various regions. For instance, here in the bottom row, you see the different colors correspond to different anatomical cortical regions. And then, for example, we can study the volume of these regions and then compare the subject with disease and healthy, or for instance, compare subject with different cognitive functions and to see the variation of the volume, how it relates to disorders or the cognitive performance. This might say us a lot about the functions of different brain regions, but still we don't know the cause why we have this variation. And one of the reasons could be because of environment factors, how we call it, the lifestyle, physical activities, diet, or alcohol, or smoking. But what is also important, and what our human brain has in common with other organs and human body, that a lot of this variation is defined by genetics. And here comes the second part of imaging genetics. As you might know that we all have chromosomes which we inherited from our parents, part from our mother and part from our father. And the chromosomes is basically a smart way packed double helix structure of DNA, which if we simplify consists of the billions of building blocks, which are on this image are labeled as uh, four letters, A, T, C, G. What is interesting about these building blocks that if we took a two random person from this uh, room and uh, then extract their DNA, then and compare them. So most of these building blocks will be similar from the three billions, but there are still tens of millions of them which will be different. And this variation actually gives us that genetic influence, for example, in our brain. In a classical way, 
in uh, genetics would be, for instance, to have uh, two groups of people. For instance, in this example, we can say that a uh, group of people with red hat, they have Alzheimer's disease, and then just compare the DNA. And as I said before, most of these building blocks are similar between them, but I highlighted one of them which is different. And this building block might be responsible for disease status. While it's very important for study like when you have a case and control or health and disease, but it still doesn't say anything about how these variant affect the human brain. And here comes an image in genetics where we actually want to combine both methods and instead of studying the healthy and uh, disease people, we can study some brain measurement in this simple example that's just a uh, head size. And then we can apply the same method and see that here again I highlighted one variant which gives us variation of human head size. And while it's just a simple example, of course in real life we want to go further, we want to go to the high dimensional, high resolutional data because we want to understand the complexity of our brain as much as possible. And that's what we are doing in imaging genetics. But uh, there are many barriers or challenges which we can face and which I try to overcome in my thesis and my research. First of all, as I said, near imaging can provide us tens or even hundreds of different measurements of the human brain. And not all of them relevant, not all of them genetically defined, or not all of them give us additional information. Second, as I already said, we want to study millions of these building blocks in our DNA. And if we go to the more high dimensional space, high dimensional features from near imaging, that gives us additional complexity. And then even a simple statistical test might be not feasible to perform because of the computational problem. And the last one is what which I call a big data. It's not only about the processing of this data, but also about the uh, sample size which we need to actually detect this effect on the human brain. Because all these building blocks, genetic variants, they have really tiny effect on the human brain. And that's why we need to pull together tens of thousands of subjects to really de to detect it. And actually, I want to first to start with the last point because I was lucky enough to be here in Rotterdam, where we have amazing Rotterdam study with, tens, with the thousands of the participants with both MRI and genotype data. But also I was happy enough to be part of the CHARGE consortium, where I worked together with many colleagues, smart and talented colleagues in different countries, and also uh, worked together with people from Enigma consortium. And this is important because all these get, uh, enable me to perform quite interesting research and uh, analyze the cohorts from all over the world. And uh, actually, I want to start first from chapter two of my thesis, where I showed that some of the brain phenotypes are very high dimensional phenotypes, are very relevant and important for genetic research. And first of them, subcortical shapes. And uh, this phenotype we can basically extract from uh, using special algorithm. We first uh, can segment subcortical structures from MRI. And then here you see the seven subcortical structures. And then per each of them, we can ex compute thousands of measurements of the shape. And then we can ask the question, how much these measurements are defined by genetics? So we can perform analysis and here on the right side, you see the map of these measurements, how much they defined by genetics, what we call heritability. And you see that this pattern is quite complex. There are clusters with a red color, which represent the highly genetically defined regions, but there are also part of the structures with the blue color, which less genetically defined. And this is very important because different part of these structures, they have different functions. And if we would study this on the more high level, we might miss this complexity. And then from these thousands of measurements of subcortical structures, we can go further to more high dimensional, to more dim high dimensional space with the voxels, where we have millions of voxels in our MRI, and the voxels are represent 
the highest available uh, data, the highest available resolution of the data from MRI. And what I also did, I studied how this works as defined by genetics. And we also see the complex pattern that are some of them uh, more heritable and some of them less. But we, what I also did, I studied how a specific variant does affect these voxels. And we see that bottom image is how one variant associated with various brain regions. And you also see that this does affect different brain regions beyond the, some anatomical defined, defined uh, regions. So, but of course, we want to go from this one variant, 10 variant, on 10, var 10 variants to all of them. And as I said, there are 10 millions of them in our genotype. And then basically, we call this genome-wide association study. We want to analyze how all of them affect these high-dimensional features. But then we have a next issue that if we want to run it for such simple experiment like I showed before with the head size, it takes one day to compute. But if we want to go to millions of voxels in human brain, that would take thousands of years. And if you want to convert it, how many PhD students you need to do, you need two, more than 200 PhD students to finish this. That's why in my, one of my chapter, I developed a, a Hayes framework, which includes uh, some advanced algorithm. And actually this framework enable us to run such analysis instead of thousands of years, just within hours. And then in next chapter, we apply this, we apply this framework. And first, within the charge consortium, we studied uh, how, uh, how our cortical regions, in this case, in measurement of cortical volume, sickness, and surface area, are affected by genetics using the also Hayes framework. And I'm very, it might sound too much, and I'm very, but I'm very excited about this research because actually this is the first time in human history when we define some genes which are influencing the human cortex. And actually we found quite a lot of them. We found 161 independent genetic variant, and here you see the map of the association, how they distributed on different chromosomes. And uh, of course, what I also wanted to do, the ultimate goal was to perform a voxelwise GWAS. And then also in collaboration with CHARGE and Enigma Consortium, we pulled data together from all available cohort with the voxel data and genotype and perform a voxelwise genome study. And uh, we found more than 20 genes or uh, genetic variants which are associated with different parts of the brain. But here I show example for the most two of them, the most significant of two of them, because you can see that the clusters of the associations of these green spots on the surface of the cortex, they goes beyond just volumetric, just beyond just biologically defined regions. And that's also important because if we would study human brain on, again on a my, much higher level, we might miss this signal and might miss this association. And uh, uh, I want to conclude with a brief summary of my main research. So the first, I propose new Im near imaging phenotypes for genetic studies. I develop a new method for imaging genetics research. And also we identify a new genetic variants which are associated with various uh, brain measurements. So and with this, I want to give back words to the Sir Rector Magnificus. Thank you.